ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Ceci. And I'm Angela. And we are the hosts of the Bravo Docket. The Bravo Docket is a chart-topping podcast that you can listen to to understand what is actually going on in the lawsuits that are making the headlines. Ceci and I are two practicing attorneys who take our experience and knowledge of the law and apply it to the lawsuits and legal issues involving your favorite celebrities. Every hour-long episode covers the facts, the law, and the legal tea. People have questions, and we answer them. From things like Todd and Julie Chrisley's sentencing to why a trending celebrity was sued, we use our knowledge and experience to help you understand what happened. We explain it all. So check us out everywhere podcasts are streaming for Facts, Fun, and Law 101. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com Shares for beginners. So many people don't know the history and they should know the history for no other reason than need to understand why we are where we are. The role that history played to get us to where we are and the events that took place, right? I mean, the same thing like any history, right? I mean, you should understand the history to get there. And, you know, for me, I had the most unbelievable 40-year career at the New York Stock Exchange. I just clicked my heels every single day going to work. Every single day, I just couldn't wait to get there. I had my own business, but it was exciting and every day was different. Different than you fought all day long. You know, you and I could have been best friends, but if we were on opposite sides of a trade in the stock, I fought for my customer, you fought for yours. And at the end of the day, I'd say, come on, let's go out to dinner and grab a beer. And that's what we did. G'day, and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. Many listeners to this podcast are too young to remember even comparatively recent events like the global financial crisis. Sometimes I like to reflect on where we've come from as a guide to where we're headed. History doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. Today, we're looking back through the mists of time with my guest, Kenny Polcari. Hi, Kenny. Hey, how are you? I'm really good. Kenny is managing partner of Case Capital Advisors, senior market strategist of Slatestone Wealth, and a CNBC financial commentator. A member of the New York Stock Exchange since 1986, he brings over 30 years of executive management experience in institutional equities and wealth management. So, this was back in 1980, I believe, when you first started at the New York Stock Exchange. What was it like for a young Kenny entering the floor <laughs> for the first time? <laughs> well, you have to understand where I was in 1980. I was 19 years old. Wow. <laughs> I had just finished my freshman year in college. And, you know, I'm a kid from Boston. I'm not from New York. I had no idea what the New York Stock Exchange was. I didn't know a stock from a bond, a buy from a sell, an eight from a quarter. And I was going to school in Washington, D.C. because I thought I wanted to be a, a lawyer and a politician and, you know, ultimately president of the United States, which I am so happy never happened. <laughs> but while I was during my freshman year, I had this opportunity to consider going to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in the summer as a summer intern. And uh, I thought to myself, my first reaction was, why would I want to do that? Why would any 19-year-old kid want to go to New York City in the summertime when I grew up uh, in Boston and spent summers on Cape Cod and had every intention of going back to the Cape to be a lifeguard on the beach after my freshman year in college, uh, which sounded perfectly you know, legit to me. And then I don't know what happened. Over, over the course of the second semester, I just kept thinking about this opportunity. And I thought, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen here? I'm going to go there. I'm going to uh, have this experience. And if I don't like it, I could put it on my resume and, you know, chalk it up as experience. I said, or I could go there and it might change the course of my life. And in fact, I went there and it absolutely changed the course of my life. The idea of becoming a lawyer and a politician went right out the window and I was completely completely enamored by what I experienced at the New York Stock Exchange. Now, you have to remember, in 1980, the New York Stock Exchange, there were no computers, nothing, zero. There wasn't even a calculator, like a plug-in calculator on the floor, right? Um, there was no television, no radio. There certainly wasn't any internet, Yahoo, and LinkedIn, and, and Twitter. None of that stuff existed. And when you were on the floor, you were really almost in a cocoon, right? Because you couldn't get information about what was happening in the outside world because there was no outside sources. There were, you couldn't listen to the radio. You didn't have TV, they, right? It was all very, very calculated. And the only way that you got that information was when somebody from the outside called down would tell you. But one way or the other, when I walked on the floor of the exchange that summer, 
I walked into a building that had 5,000 type A personalities in it, running around, screaming and yelling, buying and selling and bidding and offering and all these stocks. And I was completely mesmerized from the minute I walked through that door. I'd never seen anything like it. And even though I didn't understand a single thing that was going on, because they spoke in a different language, they spoke in abbreviated sentences, they spoke in fractions, the way they represented a buy order, the way they represented a sell order, you know, was very different. So if you didn't understand the language, it appeared to be chaotic and confusing, yet it was none of that at all. Now, that first summer, you know, I did exactly what I was there to do. I was a gopher, right? I was I was an intern. I didn't, since I didn't really know anything, I couldn't do much other than go get coffees, go get lunch, ask a lot of questions, you know, write reports and then deliver them around to where they had to go. That was the role of the intern, right? So that's what I did. But with every passing day, I paid just a little bit more attention, a little bit more attention. And suddenly I just, I was there for about three and a half weeks and it just bit me in the backside and I found my passion. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so I stayed there that whole summer. And you have to remember too, in, 19, in 1980, you know, if we traded 30 million shares the whole day, that would have been a lot. If the Dow moved by 50 cents, it would have been a big move on the Dow. But yet it was so energetic. It was so, if you're a type A personality, you know what I mean. Type A's feed on type A's, right? And so um, the energy level was just incredible. And I fell in love with the place. So I stayed there that summer. Can I just ask a question there at this point? How was a buy-sell spread displayed? I mean, we see it on a screen these days. So that's a great question. There was no technology, right? There were the posts. They called them the posts, and they were shaped like horseshoes. Behind the post stood the specialist clerk, and in front of the post stood the specialist, who was the member, and it was his job to make the market in the stock, right? And above him, above the specialist, was another horseshoe-shaped attachment that was connected to the bottom part of the horseshoe shape with you know posts and stuff, but they were literally manual dials, Right. Because there was no technology. So you'd walk in there and you'd see, you know, IBM, which was IBM. And then next to it, you'd see the last sale. And then next to that, there would be a, a plus sign or a minus sign. And then there'd be the fractions at eight, the quarter, three, eight, five, eight, seven, eight. But it was on a dial. Right. And then next to that was a bid and an offer again on dials, on manual Think about this, manual dials. And there was someone who worked there who was called the reporter who worked for the New York Stock Exchange. He didn't work for the specialist unit. He worked for the exchange. And it was his or her job to record, record every sale and then change, manually reach up and turn the dial to reflect what the last sale was. Was it up an eighth? Was it down an eighth? Was it up a quarter? And then reflect the bid and the offer and then the size of the bid and the offer. And they used to do that manually. And you're talking 1980, which, okay, now it's, you know, 40 years ago. But at the time, it was amazing. When I think about it now, it was amazing how that worked, right? Because look, like I said, you did 30 million shares a day, but you did 30 million shares across, you know, 3,000 stocks that trade there. And they didn't trade at the speed at which it trades today at all. Because first of all, it was only 30 million shares. Second of all, because we traded in fractions and there were only eight price points between 20 and $21, there were only eight price points. It was an eight, the quarter, three, eight, seven, five, six, seven, eight. That's it. And so the markets were much more controlled. And they didn't spin out of control like that. And so um, I guess it was easy to do, but that's how they displayed it. Wow. And at that time, 1980, there was a yes. very long bear market at that stage. The 70s, we were just coming out of the Jimmy Carter presidency, which was a disaster of a presidency, right? We had the oil embargo. We had the Iranian hostage crisis. The country was morally broken and bankrupt. Inflation was starting to spin out of control. Economic stagnation. It was just, it was a horrible, horrible time. Now, remember in the 70s, you know, 75, 76, I was in high school. So I wasn't working yet. I lived in the country. And I, even though I was a kid, you know, you could see that things weren't necessarily all a bed of roses, right? That the economy was in a tough place. And then when the Iranian hostage crisis happened and the oil embargo, it was just a disaster. But in 1980, remember Ronald Reagan had just become president in January and the world was starting to change. They were already discussing this massive tax reform package. They were talking how they were going to deal with the economy and all that stuff. So you could start to see change 
but it hadn't happened yet. It had not happened yet. It really didn't happen until until 1982, 83, after the tax reform package got passed, actually. And, uh, you know, listen, interest rates in 1981 and 82 were approaching 20% in this country. And inflation was running at 13% and unemployment was running at 10 plus percent. That was a disaster. It was a disaster. So think about this for a minute. If you were someone who had any money at all back in 1981 or 1982, and you could take your money and go to the bank and give your money to the banker and he'd put it in a CD and you were going to get guaranteed 21% on your money, zero risk, sleep at night. Think about what I just said, 21%, zero risk versus you could take your money and buy Johnson & Johnson and Coca-Cola and IBM, which are all fine American companies, yet they're full of risk, right? They're stocks, they're full of risk. And so what had happened was in the early 80s, money piled into the banks, into the CDs and out of the market. The market was not the market it is today by any stretch, but it was during that early years of the Reagan presidency when all that started to happen. And um, the cliche is, of course, in the 80s is um, that Michael Douglas film, which I can't even remember now <laughs> the name of. But uh, there was this idea that um, there was all these slick investment bankers um, putting out very sophisticated products and ripping off the rest of the American economy. But I believe it was a bit more blue collar working class than that. Yeah, it was. It, you know, you're going to have to make me Google the name of that show right now, that movie right now. Was it Wall Street? Greed is good, all of that. I can't believe it's so, so long ago. Uh, greed is good, yeah. Yeah, I guess it was. I guess it was just saying it was, was Wall Street, right? But the Wall Street that was depicted in the movie wasn't the Wall Street that I knew at all, right? And the Wall Street that was depicted in Wolf of Wall Street and the kid, that the penny stock kid that, you know, uh, that scammed, you know, investors up and down was not the world I was in. I'm not saying that that world didn't exist somewhere. It was just not my world. It was not where I... Um, my experience where I lived, right? Not at all. So I did that in the summer of 80, 81, 82, because I was in college, right? So I would spend the summer, I went back to college, sophomore year, I went back in the summer of uh, 81, I went back to college for junior year. Now it was the summer of 1982. And um, I was back in New York. And here's what happened. The broker that I had been working for in the summer of 80 and 81 was having a really tough time by the summer of 82. That was when the crisis, like the economy was at its worst as we went into 82, right? Reagan was, they were talking about the tax reform package, but they, they really had to push up because the economy was just in a horrendous place. And this broker that I had worked for for two years, when I showed back up to work for him for the third summer, put his arm around me and he said to me, you know, I'm sorry, but I can't even keep you. Now you have to remember, I was making a $125 a week for this intern job, right? $125 a week. And he said to me, it's just another bill that I can't, I can't pay, right? It was $500 a month is what he was paying me, but it was $500 that he just couldn't afford to pay. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe this is the summer I'm going to go back and be the lifeguard on the beach because I knew the economy was horrible. And what's wrong with being a lifeguard at the beach? But I had now spent, you know, this would have been my third summer down there. And I knew a lot of people from the prior two summers. I thought to myself, okay, let me walk around and let me go just see what's going on. And maybe there's an opportunity, maybe there isn't. And I walked around and I ran into this other broker who I also knew who had a very different kind of business. He had what you called an options layoff business when the options market was just starting to really kick in in the early 80s. And so his business was very robust. And... Um, the other guy did not have that kind of business, which is why, you know, his business was not as robust. Anyway, so I, when I saw this guy, he saw me, gave me this big hug. Welcome back, blah, blah, blah. How you doing? And I said to him, well, listen, I'm fine. I said, but I, I don't think I'm going to be here this year. I said, because, you know, Doug can't afford to have me. He's not, his business is not doing well. I said, so I came by to see if there's an opportunity. If there isn't, I'm, I'm going back to Boston. So he looked at me and he said, hey, kid, do you know the symbol for IBM? I <laughs> go, Yes, sir. It's IBM. Do you know the difference between an eighth and a quarter? I go, yes, sir. He goes, do you know the difference between a buy and a sell? I go, yes, sir. He goes, how's 250 a week? 250? I just got a raise. Are you kidding me? I hit the jackpot. I was like, when can I start? So I started, I started the next day and I spent, I was there. It was the summer of 1982 and I'll never forget it because that was the birth of the greatest bull market this country's ever known. It was August 17th, 1982. Um, because people don't remember that that was they, a great They book. don't it's, remember. It's yeah. 
But that is so key to the story because it was then that they had just passed the Reagan tax reform package. Inflation, like I said, was running it better than 10%. Unemployment was 13% and interest rates were 21%. People laughed out. Mortgage rates were 18.5%. Today, today, they might be 2%. And all these millennials who only know zero interest rates are getting nervous because they might go up to 3%. And oh my God, what am I going to do? Uh, dude, hello, wake up. They were 18.5% when I was your age, right? And uh, I mean, it's funny because I remember it. It was my generation. I remember it. I lived it. You, I can't, you can't blame the kids who are 30 or 35 years old who don't know any better. But when you try to explain it to them and they think, oh, you're just a dinosaur, you don't know. <laughs> no, no, I'm not a dinosaur because watch what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Interest rates are going to soar. But that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, it was uh, August 17th, and I'll never forget it because this is such a great story as well. The Fed used to come out on Thursday mornings at 8.30 whenever they were going to make an announcement. It was known. It was Thursdays at 8.30. That was it. Everyone knew it. The same way like they know, you know, like you know when the uh, unemployment report's coming out. It's just a fixed date, right? So you know it, all that. When the Fed would come out, they would open the door, they'd step up to the podium. The Fed chair would, would just say what they were doing. He'd close his binder. He'd walk out. There was nobody in the room. There was no press conference. There weren't people, you know, raising their hands to ask him questions, to trying to pin him down. He made the statement. He closed his binder. He walked away. He shut the door behind him. It was an oracle. It was like Moses handing down the tablets. That's right. But it was up to the markets to have to figure out what all that meant. And what was happening now in the economy? What was happening with rates? And then prices would adjust. And that was really the free market at work. Now, today, ever since the financial crisis, you know, when, when the world and the financial system imploded, today they do it much differently, right? They, I mean, they, they warn you weeks in advance and they hold your hand and say an accident, come down and lay on my couch and let me hold your hand. Are you okay with this before we make our decision? And we have to make sure everyone's okay. That's baloney. So on Monday, August 16th, there had been a rumor that the Fed was going to come out on this Tuesday morning. and Everybody discounted it. You laughed about it. No way. The Fed never does that. Not happening. It's just a rumor. OK, but then Tuesday morning came. And as we approached 830, now remember, the market didn't open until 930. So, you know, at 7, 730, 8 o'clock, the floor was filling up with the people and everyone was getting their stuff ready for the day, blah, blah. And it was interesting because as the clock approached 830, there was this kind of curiosity in a sense, but remember, there was no radio and television on the floor. And so you didn't really know it was going to happen other than you were reading a newspaper. But what did the newspaper tell you? It told you what happened yesterday. It didn't tell you what's happening today. And it was 830. And the Fed came out and made this surprise announcement, which caught everybody off guard because, again, they had never done anything like this. And they stepped out from behind the counter. Paul Volcker was Fed chair. He's no longer alive, but Paul Volcker was Fed chair. And he stepped out and he announced that the Fed was slashing interest rates by 10 percent. 10 percent was two full percentage points because rates were 21 percent. So he announced that they were slashing interest rates by 10 percent. They were going to break the back of uh, stagflation. They were going to break the back of unemployment. They were going to reinvigorate this economy. Oh, and by the way, here's this Reagan tax reform package. And they slashed taxes and they you know plowed all this money back into the economy and that day was the birth of the bull market. That's the day that every phone, every single phone at 8.30 and 30 seconds lit up like a Christmas tree. And the phones were the phones were these industrial metal phones that had six push buttons on each side. So you could potentially have 12 lines coming into your phone. And the phones were stacked one on top of the other. So I had two sets of phones. I had a total of 24 lines that I could have clients for, right? Every light every, at 8.30 and 30 seconds, every light on everybody's phone lit up. It was like Christmas in December because the phones rang like a ring, like a ring and not all these songs and dances that they do today. But it was like that old fashioned ring. Right. And uh, every phone rang. It was unbelievable. You picked up the phone and the guy on the other end was someone who worked at Goldman or first boss or some regional broker. Going, oh, my God. Did you see what happened? No, I didn't see what happened. What happened? Tell me what happened. And they came out and they told you what the Fed had done. And then it started. Right. Buy orders. Oh, my God. Buy orders like you wouldn't believe it was by 50,000 IBM, by 100,000 Coca-Cola, by 300,000 General Electric. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so the the market 
exploded higher. Now, I say exploded because it went up 4.5%. 4.5% was a big move. It was 35 points because the Dow was trading at 792. The market ran 4.5%, had never done that, was up 35 points, and we traded 138 million shares. Now, remember what we said. On Monday, we traded 30 million shares. You know, the Dow was up 25 cents. On Tuesday, we traded 138 million shares, and the Dow was up 35 points, Right. And it was unbelievable. I remember like it was yesterday and I can feel it as I'm telling you this story. I can feel it. I can feel the energy like my, you know, my head is sweating thinking about what it was like that day. But it was it was unbelievable. And then the markets continued to trade higher and higher and higher after that, because that was really right. And then rates came down. Paul Volcker did exactly what he did. He brought rates down and brought rates down. He forced money out of the banks into the markets and the market took off. And so I went back to college in September of 1982 two for my senior year of college. And the guy that I was now working for offered me a job upon graduation in May, which again was really amazing because kids in college couldn't get a job. Meanwhile, I was going back for my senior year and I had a job already for the following May doing something that I wanted to do. I was going to make $36,000 a year. I was like, oh my God, I hit the lottery. People don't understand these days how hard it was to get a job back then. No idea, you know, how tough it was. I left the university and uh, drove taxis because there was nothing else to do. Listen, there, there weren't all these private equity firms and all these startup companies. None of that existed. It's such a wonderful world we live in these days. But anyway, over to you, Kenny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really unbelievable. And so here's the thing I didn't do. And I would, in retrospect, if I were my younger self again, I might have done it differently. But when I went back to college, I went to Boston University. When I went back to college my senior year, knowing that I had this job nine months out upon graduation, I didn't do a thing in terms of write a resume, go on interviews, kind of put myself through that process. Why would I do that, I thought, because I don't want any other job. I have the job I want. But what I deprived myself of was the opportunity to put myself in those positions, right? Going on an interview, preparing for the interview, writing the resume, writing the cover. I did none of that. And who knows, had I done that, maybe my life would have changed again. Maybe I would have ended up somewhere else. I don't know. But one way or the other, since I never did it, I can't go back there and speculate, right? I had the greatest senior year of my life in college because I had this job, and uh, it was amazing. Graduated in May of 83. I moved to New York in July of 83. And remember, I'm a kid from Boston. I'm the middle of five kids from a Boston Italian family. And so when I told my mother I was moving to New York, she wasn't happy with me because, you know, Italian mothers want their kids all around them. You're killing your mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you have to buy the house next door and you have to marry the girl next door and you have to live there for the rest of your life. Meanwhile, I said to her, you know, my, don't worry about it. I'm just going to go to New York for a couple of years. I'll get some experience and I'll come back to Boston. I'll buy the house next door and I'll marry the girl next door. All that stuff. Meanwhile, 40 years later and I, Never moved back to Boston. And I, you know, my life just became all about the New York Stock Exchange. And I became a member of the exchange in 1985. What does that actually mean, becoming a member of the Stock Exchange? Well, the members were the people that were running around, that were actually in the crowds, that were bidding and offering and representing the client at the point of sale. Now, remember, the New York Stock Exchange was an institutional marketplace. If you as a retail investor wanted to buy 50 shares of American Telephone and put it in your retirement account, that order is not the order that would come to me, right? Our customers were the institutions, right? So they were mutual funds. They were hedge funds. They were retirement plans. They were foundations. They were any institution that was managing money. Right, that needed to buy 500,000 shares of Coca Cola or sell 300,000 shares of IBM. If you were a retail investor, how would you be able to invest in those days? Well, as a retail investor, what you did was it was so funny. The order flow would end up coming to New York. They'd combine the orders together, right? So all the brokers upstairs, they'd say, you know, I got a client that wants to buy 50 shares of Coke, and the guy next door, you had a client that was going to buy Coke, and the other guy had a client. And so they'd combine the orders and they'd put all the orders together and they'd send one order for. 5,000 shares down to the floor. And then that order would get executed, but then that 5,000 shares would get distributed amongst all those people that wanted to buy or sell the stock, right? But it didn't come down individually. Like, this guy wants to buy 50 shares. No, it didn't. It came down. They combined the orders, and then the order got executed, and then it got allocated out. But also, remember, don't forget, everything was done by phone, and there was no automation. So you couldn't go online. You couldn't enter an order in a computer. You had to call your broker. Your broker had to physically call the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. They had to write an order by hand. They had to set clock it. They had to send it out to the broker who was executing it in the crowd. I mean, it was... It was the most fantastic place in the world. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but anyway, so I 
I became a member in 1983. 1983, I was 24 years old. I was one of the youngest members of the exchange to have ever become a member. And my wife, I met my wife uh, at the New York Stock Exchange, who um, is a minority. She's my wife is Puerto Rican. And she had started, she's a couple of years older than me. And so she had started a little bit ahead of me. And she started out as a kid, as a runner on the floor and worked her way up and ultimately became a member herself in April of 1984, about, you know, year and a half ahead of me, but did it all on her own. She didn't have family. She didn't have brothers, sisters, uncles, whatever, nobody there, completely on her own at a time when women were a complete minority. You know, there were 1,366 members. And at the time she became a member, I think she was the 10th or 11th female member and the first Latina member, right? There were other women. There was a black woman that was that had become a member ahead of her. She worked for York Securities. My wife then became a member as a, as a minority, right? We're talking about not only women, but then minority women. So um, it was a really exciting time. But it was also a time when the world was starting to change, right? When women were hitting their head on the glass ceiling. There were plenty of women that worked on the floor, but they did what was typically considered to be the female jobs. They were teletype jobs. They were, you know, typing into the computer. The, the execution that the men would do, the women would then have to type the, all those trades into the computer. That was typically the role of women, right? Or they were secondary clerks. But then in the in the early 80s, the women started to say, you know, baloney, I want his job because it's much more exciting. And that's the job I want. My wife was one of those people. But, you know, she had the personality to do it and she wasn't going to take no for an answer. And she fought until she did it. And she did. And then she fought and then she became a member of the New York Stock Exchange. And I mean, when I say fought, what what I mean is she was ambitious. She worked hard. She proved herself. And she did it. She became a member in 1984. I became a member in 1985. We got married in 1985. Uh, she had her business. I had my business. And then she got pregnant, you know, six months later. And she worked, ran around the floor of the exchange until she was eight months pregnant. You know, think about that. And there have been a handful of women that have done that. But look, you were on your feet all day. I say that because it was a tough job to do as a pregnant woman because you're on your feet all day. There's no sitting down. Uh, you know, it's just the way it was, right? And so when she was, you know, eight months pregnant, she had to stop. And at that point, she retired because then she wanted to be a mother. And so that's what she did. And uh, our daughter was born in, you know, March of 87. And the, from there, the rest is history in that sense. And I stayed, right? And I just I just loved every... I couldn't wait. My alarm would go off at four o'clock in the morning and I'd jump out of bed. I lived about an hour, an hour and a half north of Wall Street, right? So I'd have to take a shower, get dressed, get out to the train station, take the train into the city, then take the subway downtown. By the time you did that, it took me an hour and 10 minutes to, to do the travel part, right? And so... Um, yeah, I'd get up at four. I'd you know be out the door by four thirty. I'd stop at the coffee shop, buy a cup of coffee, and grab my newspaper and be down at the train by five o'clock. And then you took the train into town. You know, you drank your coffee on the on the train. You read the newspaper, and then you just went to work. But it was, God, what I tell you, it was the most unbelievable place. And, you know, and I and I had the opportunity to be there during such an incredible time in history. Right. And and not only in the markets, but um, policy and, uh, you know, during the Reagan years and what that meant for investments and what that meant for the economy and then how the markets reacted and the excitement and all that stuff. And look, the markets, the markets um, made a fantastic move from. Uh, August 82 till October of 1987, where we had the Black Monday, right? The crash of 87. But look, in August of 1982, the Dow stood at 792. That was the Dow, the level of the Dow. Today, it's at 34,000, right? When it was born, it was born, the Dow was trading at 792. By the time October 19th came of 1987, the Dow was trading, it had traded all the way up to 2,800. So it had this fantastic move over the five or six years in terms of a percentage move. Kenny, can I just interrupt for a moment? I try and keep these interviews to about 30 minutes. Yeah, we've only we've only gotten through five years. And we've only we've only gotten to <laughs> 1987. I'm listening I'm listening to this David Bowie podcast at the moment. And when I recommend it to friends, I say, it takes nine episodes to get to 1970. Right. It's the best <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, you know what? There's so much history that I think people don't know. Right. And I know, you know, people go, oh, yeah, I think the history is so fantastic for people to understand. So do I. This is why I'm glad to be talking to you. But what I wanted to do is I'm going to um, cut this up and do it over a couple of episodes. So when we return, Kenny, the next time we hear from you, it'll be October 1987, the Black Monday crash. 
Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi, I'm Ceci. And I'm Angela. And we are the hosts of the Bravo Docket. The Bravo Docket is a chart-topping podcast that you can listen to to understand what is actually going on in the lawsuits that are making the headlines. Ceci and I are two practicing attorneys who take our experience and knowledge of the law and apply it to the lawsuits and legal issues involving your favorite celebrities. Every hour-long episode covers the facts, the law, and the legal tea. People have questions and we answer them. From things like Todd and Julie Chrisley's sentencing to why a trending celebrity was sued, we use our knowledge and experience to help you understand what happened. We explain it all. So check us out everywhere podcasts are streaming for Facts, Fun, and Law 101. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. <laughs>